it's caused quite a bit of excitement. It's the notion that to fully understand how the brain works, how cognitive uh, processes operate, you have to acknowledge that the brain is embodied. It lives in a body, it uses a body, it gets all its sensations through a body that carries sensory epithelia, sensory sheets, sensory organs. Not only that, but the way that we acquire that information, the way that we sample our world, the way that we are coupled, uh, tethered to the world, depends upon movement. If you think about it, there's very little that you can do, apart from secretion, without movement, without your body. You know, speaking, looking at different parts of the world, perambulating, moving around, redeploying limbs, Nearly everything depends simply upon moving your body. So the only way that the brain can talk to the environment is through its body. And if you deny that and just look at the brain as some passive sensory filter that's in a privileged position of receiving all this rich, interesting sensory information which it has to make sense of, you're going to get a very false perspective on the game that the brain is actually playing, which is not just about filtering and making sense of sensory input, it's actually actively going out there and sampling that input and using its body to do that under all the imperatives that uh, having a body implies. So embodied cognition is just about acknowledging the importance of the body. There are whole flavours, uh, very interesting flavours and ranges of commitment to that embodied context. Um, so usually um, discussed under, under the rubric of inactivism. So a weak form of inactivism is that our actions are important. So for example, active inference or in the uh, domain of say vision, active vision, active sensing is adding to the complication of making sense of uh, visual patterns of information in terms of what caused them you now also have to go and gather the information that resolves uncertainty about what caused them. So you have to actively sample very salient parts of the visual world. A practical problem that if you were devising robots that have to scan for dangerous operants at, a, 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 at an airport, for example, you would need to solve. You would need to know where to go and sample information to resolve uncertainty about what is this person doing? How is this person feeling? What is this person going to do next? So that's the active vision uh, and active sensing um, aspect of a, a non-radical, um, almost cons commonsensical inactivism. But we can go right to the other end, which is radical inactivism. And at that end, uh, the philosophical position here is that you can completely dispense almost with the brain. You can certainly dispense with representationalism. And the way that I um, find it most easy to understand that philosophical stance is to um, uh, go and look at YouTube videos of beautifully engineered robots that are reminiscent of Victorian toys that just by falling gracefully reproduce some very animate, very intentional sort of um, motion. So the, the most famous example is the walking robot from uh, the United States that um, is basically designed to fall downhill. But it does it so gracefully, it looks as though it's walking. So it just walks down a shallow ramp. And yet there is not one control, there's not one electrical component. It is all in the body. It's all in the carefully crafted uh, articulation of the bodily parts. So this would be the radical version of embodied, well, it's not even cognition, radical inactivism. That if the body is sufficiently tuned to the environment, you don't even need cognition. That everything is in, um, in the coupling of the body to the environment in which it is immersed. That philosophy is probably a bit radical for some, but inherits a lot of, um, I think, much more um, compelling philosophy from people like Gibson um, in the 20th century, who suggested that the, the way that we perceive things is only um, in the service of how we can act upon them. So something um, that uh, can be seen is only seen in virtue of 
how it can be manipulated. So I see an apple, what I actually see is the opportunities afforded by that apple for grasping, for acting upon. So every perceptual uh, capability is grounded in a fundamental way by the opportunities for action that that percept affords. So we only see through the eyes of our muscles in terms of what it means for our behaviour. And he called that affordance and uh, uh, elaborated the notion of direct perception. And that directness, if you like, shortcuts or short circuits, this more elaborate representationalist cognitive perspective that the radical um, people um, consider to be unnecessary to understand uh, embodied cognition. So different flavours. Um, um, typically um, one would also talk about other ways of uh, embodying cognition, extending cognition, enacting cognition. I've talked about embodied cognition, sometimes also known as situated cognition, that my cognitive processes depends upon the situation that I find my body in. Uh, we've talked about inactivism. Extended cognition is one of the, in this instance, three E's, uh, it would be useful to mention. So this is the notion largely championed by people like Andy Clark, who uh, uh, in, um, in the latter half of, of uh, the last century, the 20th century, was intrigued by the notion that much of our cognitive capacity actually resides outside our mind. It actually lives in things like uh, telephones. So you may think you know the telephone number of your partner. But in fact, it may be the case you don't actually know. You know where it is, and you can do a speed redial, or you can call it up uh, with some sort of code or mnemonic from your mobile phone. But it is your mobile phone that actually knows the actual number to dial. So has your cognition somehow stopped when we come outside the mind and into your mobile phone? Or is that cognitive competence now extended into the physical world beyond, in fact, your body? So it's a beautiful example, um, I think, of you know, what we mean by cognition. Is it all in the head? Or is it somehow um, a partnership with the environment, a partnership with the world, a partnership with the, situ the physical situation um, that we find ourselves in, uh, that we mediate and couple with through our, through our body? And will our body allow us our cognition to extend further than uh, just the, the mental faculties normally associated with us. From my perspective, um, I, I, the, the revolution, the inactivist revolution, well, I, I think almost revolution in the sense of revolving because I think every few decades people come to the realisation you can't just look at the brain again as some glorified stimulus response link, some bank of filters that's processing information. You really have to think about the action perception cycle, the circular causality induced by the notion that the environment is acting upon you and you are acting upon the environment and it's a dance, a dialogue. Um, so that's certainly in the ascendancy in the past few years. I personally think it's, it's a very useful and exciting development, um, uh, uh, particularly from the point of view of active inference that, um, if you like, follows from uh, more generic formulations such as things like the free energy principle that actually talks about the exchange between the internal states of a system and the external states and makes very little conceptual distinction between the direction. So just to close, I'll illustrate the sort of uh, the parsimony and the, the beauty of the sorts of concepts that you, you, know, you arrive at from a purely theoretical take on embodied cognition. If it's the case that the, the key thing is in the exchange between you with your internal states and the environment with the external states across the thing that separates, them, it separates uh, us from our environment or the internal and the external states, across this boundary that has the sensations going in that direction, actions going in that direction, that structure mathematically can be completely transposed and nothing changes. Which means that your action upon the world becomes the world's way of perceiving you. And the world acts upon you through your perception of the world. There's a beautiful symmetry there that just talks to this, uh, again, circular causality of us causally embedded in a world through uh, 
an embodiment of our brain and its cognition. Embodied cognition is not just a philosophical nicety. You know, it is certainly an intriguing uh, um, concept to consider and occupies a lot of neurophilosophical discussion, but it has real practical and pragmatic implications. So it means it matters when you do a visual stimulation study whether the subject was actively searching for something. It gives a whole new meaning to the study of eye movements, saccadic eye movements, and how they contextualize visually evoked responses. It gives a whole new meaning to the way we understand perceptual categorization in the brain in relation to our intention, in relation to the affordance that certain stimuli um, provide for us. It provides a direct entree or opens up lines of communication with the social neurosciences because um, in being embodied I have to have um, ideas and cognitive um, capabilities that model what I am physically capable of. I have a forward model or a generative model of my own motor plant, my own body. I can use that to make inferences about how you're using your body. So if I see myself um, approach a glass of water with this sort of movement, I know that usually that is a reflection of my desire or my intention to pick up the glass of water. I can now use that knowledge, that modelling of the world, to understand your intentions when you reproduce exactly the same physical movements. So we then get into the vast um, domain of systems neuroscience and psychology um, known as action observation and we get into things like mirror neuron uh, systems and how they inform our understanding about self-modeling relative to other modeling. We get into the whole world uh, of theory of mind, how I understand you. And all of this has come from acknowledging that one of the most important things that I have to perceive is my own action, my embodied action. So uh, it has, I think, uh, unified many different and possibly uh, inappropriately disparate fields uh, that were studying just, say, visual perception and just looking at motor control. Now, every, now they contextualize each other, providing a much more graceful and a better understanding of the computational principles entailed by bringing action perception together, informing experimental design, and of course one might argue ultimately um, understanding failures of embodied cognition. Um, so one might look at sort of neurological conditions or even things like autism that have once been ascribed to um, you know, purely theory of mind problems. Is this actually a failure to understand one's own internal body? So there's a whole field now of uh, um, interceptive inference that complements the perceptual inference or synthesis that I've been talking about, which goes, uh, which is now contextualized in terms of action. The same rules also apply to signals, not from the outside world through my eyes and my ears, but from my internal world, my heart rate, my literally my gut feelings. So if the same rules apply to gut feelings, that are an important aspect of embodied cognition and you can have pathologies about inferences about your emotional and gut responses then that provides a really interesting model for certain psychopathologies. It could explain why um, people with autism have difficulties understanding their own emotional responses or indeed avoiding contact in order to um, um, obviate or circumnavigate those sorts of failures.